Can you explain what you mean by the word longing, the therapist asked, because sometimes he didn't know what I was talking about. Well, I said, the first longing I ever had was for a bee. I was nine years old and I had a jam jar and thought that if I could get the bee inside, then my life would be perfect. Some of the other boys put pebbles in their jars before they went hunting in the thistles, and when the big furry bumbles were inside, they would shake the jar and taunt the bee, whispering things like, Die, ye little bastard, as the bee tried to dodge the flying stones. But I couldn't do that. All I wanted was to be close to a bee. There was nothing more beautiful than a bee and a flower, but it was out of reach, so I longed for it. Does that make sense? Go on, the therapist said. I also longed to be a poet. Every time I scrawled on a copybook in secondary school, I tingled with excitement at the possibility that I too might become Yeats. The therapist listened. Then another longing kicked in, the longing for intimacy. The time of novice adulthood, when boys obsess about their erections and crave sex. But it was the softness of being enveloped by another human being that I really longed for. The therapist's face was without expression. And then I found the beloved, I declared. Which was another kind of longing, a longing to forget my own troubles and reach out to her. That seemed like a perfect recipe for happiness. So what's your point? the therapist asked. Well, I said, my point is that longing is an, in, an unfulfilled ache. I don't think it's possible to find happiness through other people. The beloved could never make me happy. Longing is an ecstasy in itself. It's a twisted ecstasy, because I'm not a bee, and I'm not Yeats. And sometimes it's as if the beloved is from another planet. But I suppose we must live with our longing and accept it. I was thinking this is good, I was becoming eloquent, and I was talking his language at last. And then I thought the Beloved was an alternative to God, I said, a refuge for me, a shelter where joy becomes plausible for a short while. Why do you bring God into it again? he wondered. I hadn't a clue, so I tried to rephrase it. In her presence I have meaning. Even if it is only to make sure the coal buckets are full. Alone, without her for even a day, I can barely survive. I am devastated as I eat my porridge in solitude and silence and place a single bowl in the dishwasher with my single spoon. What do you long for now? he wondered. Heaven, I confessed because I am over sixty, which is also the longing that can never be fulfilled, the therapist added, because there is no heaven in our universe. Exactly, I replied. He was getting the picture. So was I. God is the object of impossible longing. God doesn't really matter. It's the longing that counts. You're saying that longing is a verb without an object. Correct, I said. A child can cling to a chair. They grip the chair because they are afraid to risk the first step without it. But when a little boy gazes at flowers and wishes that he was a bee, then his heart is open. When we long for impossible things, our hearts open. That's love. And love is always incomplete. So I long for heaven in the face of death. 
I long for heaven because although there is no heaven, it does me good just to long for it. The therapist winced. He's really not a religious person. Of course, there are other times when I feel as existential in my boots as Samuel Beckett, I continued. I feel as alone as a man on the moon when the spacecraft has folded up the ladder and gone home without him. In fact, I often dream of being abandoned on the moon, I confessed, and then I wake up in a sweat, suffocating and clinging to the bed as if it were a barren rock. Am I making sense? Not one bit, the therapist said, but go on. One night, I continued, I was in the kitchen at 4 a.m., devouring marmalade on toast, and as the moonlight fell on the floor, a great longing arose, as if there was a presence all around me, but hidden. The moonlight felt intimate. The mountain across the lake felt like a person who was gathering me into her shadows. The woodland was enfolding me. Heaven was everywhere, its exquisite tenderness just beyond my fingertips. The therapist sipped a glass of water. So I went out into the lounge and found a Russian Orthodox choir chanting on YouTube. And I sat for a long time in the moonlight, surrendering to the pain, surrendering to the wonderful ache in me for the sacred. And sometimes I feel that listening to monks chanting about the serenity of heaven does more for me than all the therapy in the world. I was sorry I shared that detail with them, so I returned to the subject of bees. The bees were so lovely on the flowers that as a child I would risk anything just to be close to them. And what did you do when you had them in the jar? He inquired, his eyes penetrating me for any sign of evasion. I allowed them to fly again, I said. I watched them stagger up the air in shock and then fly away into the wind because longing is always something that ends in the bliss of letting go. There was a pause. We watched each other in silence. My earliest recollection is of women chattering above my cot. In adolescence, my greatest comfort was the soft, posh voices of female presenters on BBC Radio 3. Even in adulthood, Radio 3 has carried me through nervous breakdowns and 100 winter flus. Of course, I loved more things about my mother than her voice. I loved the apple dumplings that she steamed in a pressure cooker and that were shaped like Christmas puddings when they came out of the bowl, though the walls of the dumpling were made of pastry and there was stewed apple on the inside. I loved the lamb's hearts she roasted in the oven and the potato cakes she buttered on winter evenings and served with fried eggs. I loved the light in her face when someone was hungry and how she could draw out more stories than a therapist by simply putting a bowl of soup under someone's nose. And chicken soup was her masterpiece. It simmered on the range in the kitchen every Sunday morning, and it was a Eucharist, more sublime than what the red-faced trembling fathers in the church presided over, as they doled out answers for every question in the universe and preached to nursing mothers from the lofty solitude of their own masculine sanctuaries. My mother got the chicken soup recipe from her mother and I remember one evening visiting 
a cousin's house and catching a familiar aroma in the air. It was the exact same recipe. I realised that my granny must have shared her secrets with all her daughters and that they in turn had passed them on. It's what women do. They pass things on. They share a knowing beyond words. They understand other people without inquiring or asking blunt questions. Wisdom surfaces in them at birth and death and at all the emotional turning points in between. They know things men don't, and they always know how movies end. They shelter men in the fabric of their knowing, and they intuit a deeper universe when a man's shallow and brittle world is falling apart. Most of all, though, I love women's voices. The sound of women singing on CDs, LPs, EPs, the internet, the wireless, YouTube, and even on the stereo of my Ford Cortina in 1973 when I was young and had a girlfriend in West Cavan. She sang, and she always insisted on filling the back seat with extra girls on our way home from dances, and they too would sing in unison, and invariably we ended up in someone's kitchen where they fried boxty and listened to Patsy Klein and danced with each other while I sat bewildered in the corner. Only men were seen as poets in Ireland, back in the old days, despite their long contribution to the tradition of poetry, women sat beside men in silent adoration, or so the poets thought, as they smoked pipes and blathered in affected posh accents. But the women were not doting. They were waiting for their time to arrive, waiting for new voices in the public world, waiting for other women to break the mould of official baritones on the Irish radio. Maybe in my romantic delusions I have woven everything I know of women and everything I love about women into an icon of the Madonna. Maybe I project on the holy face every blessing I have experienced from real women. Maybe I have never felt more absorbed in the glow of feminine power than on those May mornings long ago when the blossoming altars to Mary issued a fragrance so heavy in the church that sometimes hungry children fainted as the choir sang, O Mary, we crown thee with blossoms today, Queen of the Angels and Queen of the May. Tibetan prayer is just as ornate as Catholic pieties. I have often knelt before a shrine to Tara, the white female Buddha, with a little gathering of refugees from modernity, one-winged birds wounded by parents or complex childhoods or a variety of addictions, and we have sung the twenty-one praises of Tara. In the clouds of incense and the softly sung hymns and the forest of flowers, and I have sometimes thought that I haven't travelled very far in my entire life because it's so much the same as those childhood altars to May, the Queen of the May. I began with the Queen of the May and ended in that place of Buddhist simplicity because there's nothing as simple as a human being in prayer, nothing as clear as the shape of a man surrendering his heart to heaven. Even when the prayers and offerings or a fear and a hope before God, who is perceived as real and substantial and terrible. There's something exquisitely naked and human and open and bare about that posture of the heart, that inner openness, even if it grows initially out of fear or terror. Women have been my compass, my anchor, the ground and completeness of my universe. As I grow older and sometimes lose my instinct for religious faith, women are still the warp and weft of all my spiritual longing. I cannot forget that it was a woman's eyes that first held Jesus resurrected, and it was a woman's voice that sang the song of it, until they were outlawed. 
So it's fair to say, in summary, that for over 25 years I have benefited from therapy and loosened the grip that religion has had on me. In fact, I was almost free of religion until the icon arrived. After that, I began to brood again. I lit candles again. I dusted off the old statues and arranged a shrine again. I began to doze and dream again to see new stories rising from the ground again, to see a stream of fantastic things passing before my eyes. The icon startled me. I was afraid of it, of what it might draw me into. The icon was alive. It was a gift of love. But what should I do with it? Either I was going to sink into old age with the pair of rosary beads around my fingers, or I was going to abandon it and the sentimentality of religious faith forever. So the icon became a crossroads. A sacred object, a lens into the future. God had plundered me again. Heaven, in its glory, had re-established itself in my world. Angels had broken through taken possession of my unconscious mind, my private space, and within weeks the icon was surrounded by a varied array of ornaments, bells, water bowls, and incense holders, and multiple likenesses of God's mother, his angels, his crucified son, his many apostles, and Mary of Magdalene. Bridget of Kildare, plus an entire array of Dakinis and Buddhas that flew like butterflies out of my drawers and positioned themselves once again as luminosities on the shelves and on the top of the bookcases, like a thousand points of light arrayed around the room. The metaphors returned. I allowed them in. I soaked them up. I licked them off the ground. Off the cut stones in old cathedrals, I could not resist the lovely ghosts that ceasingly rose up to inhabit me. But I also knew I couldn't mix the two any more, the step-by-step -step guide to a healthy life that therapy provided was one way of doing things. It was a path. Religious belief was its opposite, and I stood between the two, confused a storyteller wanting to subvert both, to redefine and redefine again and again all the narratives that inhabited me. I wanted to endlessly re-edit who I was, sometimes just for the fun of it, to embrace others, not with an earnest desire to find something as serious as love, but just for the subversive play of it. The stories of Jesus and Buddha felt like a grand opera, and prayer like a long litany in sentimental songs. But at other times the language of therapy felt like a cage. I often met people who had spent years in therapy and emerged with a redefined self that they wore like a straitjacket. I'm the kind of person that trusts others too easily, they might say. I'm the kind of person that cannot plan forwards. Or I'm too spontaneous, someone might say. Or I have father issues. I am wounded. And all the time I'm wondering, who told you that? Who taught you that script? Why don't you just go to the opera or read a poem? And me remembering the Asian proverb, when you name the bird, you cease to experience the song. Do you know, I'm reading these little pieces from a book called On Tuesdays, I'm a Buddhist. And I think it was a time that, it, it just was a turning point for me, that icon. And I'm looking back now, six years later, because that was 2016. And I think that in the six years that have passed, I've, I've become clearer that for me, the, the act of longing can never be satisfied by any particular thing. 
and so longing in itself. The thing that, that the rest of the world will tell me is unhealthy, you know, the longing, how to cope with longing, how to satisfy longing. But in actual fact, that that wound, the pain of longing, is an intimate embrace with God. This sense of longing touches us through the things we want, like food or sexual pleasure or money or power or whatever. But but underneath the longing is the longing for God. It's It's because the longing itself is insatiable. And rather than be controlling it by by feeding yourself things. It's a question of falling into the longing. Falling into just, this is who I am, and indulging in the longing. That's the funny thing about, you know, when you fast, and I don't fast. I'm a lazy man. I'm overweight. It's terrible. And yet I speak these things because... I try, at least I try. I try to fast sometimes. But I certainly know that when you renounce something, when you, you you turn your back on excitement, you turn your back on food, you turn your back on something else for Lent or whatever, that you experience the longing either as something that you don't like and has to be solved, so you go and have more food, or alternative, alternatively, you kind of enter into the longing. You, you become present with this longing. I did this with cigarettes. In fact, there was a therapist that suggested it, you know, that, that we smoke because we can't bear the longing for the cigarette. And so if you enter into the longing, you know, just become aware of your desire. I am now having this desire for a cigarette. And also... In that mindfulness, be aware that this is going to last at most about five minutes. That's that's as long as a longing can endure in your body, in your in your mind body. So, rather than when you know you're overwhelmed by longing to have a cigarette or to have a drink or to have food, whatever, and you feel, oh, this is unbearable. I just really want another whiskey I'm going to have one if you can actually sustain yourself in the longing space in a mindful way I am aware that my whole body is crying out for another whiskey I'm going to stay with that longing I'm going to experience that longing as a mysterious sensation in my body and soul do that. It lasts for about three or four minutes. The longing will dissolve and you get this exquisite satisfaction. And I don't know what it is, but I, th- I, I think it's, t- to me, in my poetic way of speaking, in my metaphors, it's just the finger of God has touched you. The wound is where the light comes in. You feel this sense of, of light uh, or resilience because you have endured the longing. You've done the fast, if you like. And and when you're fasting, when you're in that state of longing for food or for other satisfactions, and you deny yourself them, you reach a state of kind of alertness, of being present, of being here now, in a way that's more real than if you were to gratify yourself with whatever you're longing for. So so what I'm saying is that this longing is always with us. It's with me from a child when I was looking for little bees and, and wanting to do nasty things, but I mean those other young fellas and they'd be doing these cruel things to, to bees and I, I, I didn't do that, I never did that. Maybe I did, maybe I should admit that there must have been once or twice that I did that, you know, putting a few stones in the jar and you catch bees and then you shake the jar. It's a really, really astonishingly cruel, 
you know, Roman Empire kind of stuff to be at. And this is like a child. This is when I was a child. Little children did that. Like, where did they get that? And as, as, it's not as if that's gone away, because I, I saw a child one time, maybe three years ago, and I was in a family home, and um, there was a live lobster in the fridge. And the child was poking the lobster. I don't think, I don't think she was hurting the lobster, but by God, she was trying to. She was experimenting on pain, not her own pain, but like the pain of the lobster. I mean, would this would this be a lot of pain for him? You'd nearly despair about human nature when you see a child doing something cruel, and you wonder, like, where do we get that? And you'd certainly despair if you, if you thought about the kind of darkness of violence when we all become adults. And I don't know, I don't know how anybody else deals with negotiating their way through life. But I think that what I found, particularly through the, the idea of longing was that longing in itself was a, a mysterious experience if you could enter into it. And there's no better time to be here now, to be present. No better time than in the longing. So that even if you kind of were saying to yourself, like, I'd love to, oh, I'd love to watch the telly now, you know. I'd love to watch a movie on Netflix. Well, even if you postpone that for 60 minutes, and then just try and be mindful. You're actually using the fact that you want to sit down and watch the movie. You become aware of that being your focus, but you become aware of it. It's, it's a really magnificent and strange thing that the conscious mind can do to become aware of itself in its own longing. You can, you can become aware of yourself in your own anger. You can be standing there, and if you're mindful, you can be saying, "This is anger. I'm, I'm, I'm full of anger." I said in the previous podcast, I was quoting a great monk from the third century, but I quoted that line where he says, "Prayer is the absence of anger." Mindfulness is always the trick, isn't it? Mindfulness is always the door through which you go to find these moments of wisdom and realisation. For me, the only thing that's different in religion is that mindfulness, for me, and I'm saying this for me, it doesn't go far enough. Because it doesn't have the moment of transformation. When I'm in the position of longing, and I'll give you a a fairly real example. Supposing I'm longing for the pain to stop. Now, there's an interesting kind of longing, okay? You're not longing for something that indulges you like another sweet, but I have been in situations over the past five years where I would be in pain. And so I would be longing for the pain to stop. And I remember there was one particular night and I was experiencing pain, and I was panicking to get out of the pain. Like, my longing for the pain to go away became intense and then hysterical, and then, you know, I was really going through the roof <coughs> with a sense of longing, please, this pain has to stop. And it's like facing the heat of a fire. I know that when I found a way to sit with the pain, it was better. I mean, life was better, even though the pain was still there. And I'm mostly talking not about intense pain, but I'm talking about the small discomfortable pain that maybe, you know, like a sore hip that I might have or a leg that's stinging and sore, you know, when I move it or something. 
like like low grade pain, not pain that would be in any way dramatic that you'd be thinking, my goodness, that's pain. No, but the kind of long sustained dull thud of a pain that you kind of, oh, I wish it would go away. And I have the same going on at the moment with my eye because detached retina was fixed and now there's cataracts that have to come out or be removed or whatever they do. And that's going to happen in about maybe six weeks' time, maybe not. So it's, a, it's another long wait. Meantime, I can only see out through one eye. The other eye is all fogged up and it's very, very uncomfortable sometimes, particularly when you leave your glasses down on the desk and you can't find them. And you're going round every surface in the room looking for the glasses and they're definitely not in the room and then you go back out into the house and they're not in the house and you say to the beloved, I can't find my glasses. And she comes out into the studio shed and she looks at the desk and she says, there they are on your desk. I don't know why that is, but I mean, with, with with one eye, you're not getting the intensity and the clarity when you pan along the surface of a desk, and if the glasses are the same colour as the desk, you look ten times and you miss them and you don't see them, and that happens. And in those frustrating situations, I would be saying to myself, God, I wish and hope that they can fix it. I hope they can fix it. I don't even know if they can fix it, but I'd be hoping they can fix it. That's a kind of a longing. And it's because, probably because the difficulties I've had in my health over the past two years are like long-term things and they don't go away too quickly, it has actually forced me to do this more, forced me to stay with the longing, to be present, to be mindful to say, I am experiencing this pain now. I am I'm feeling this discomfort now. I am I am fogged up in one eye now. And I'm now living with this. And I'm I'm aware of how I'm longing. And then the longing starts to dissolve. There's a there's a strange way that the affliction itself becomes an aperture of light. As Rumi says, you know, it's like the wound where the light comes in. And by light, I just mean a sense of, a sense of almost bliss, realization. It's just an extraordinary thing about pain, about suffering, and about longing. All the things we long for never give us happiness because the ultimate happiness is in God. The only way, the only way to say it is that our ultimate happiness is in God. And the idea that we will find union with God, the idea that that in some way my consciousness will grow strong as my body dissolves, as my body dissolves and falls apart, painfully or otherwise, and that I will find I'm resting in a kind of stillness of a greater consciousness. I will be absorbed by God. Now that may be just poetic, hyperbolic language. It may be that those words shape like a koan, like like a something that is impossible. Just the same way as the idea of resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, is like a koan, it's like a poem that stretches reality beyond the plausible. It stretches hope beyond reality. And maybe that's all it is, And yet it still has the power to transform us on the inside when we allow ourselves to embody the language. So what I'm saying is 
that when I say I believe that all my good ancestors are in heaven, when I say that my journey is to death, but in death I believe in the transformation of life and that I will find union with God, I'm using hyperbolic language, I'm using poetry. It may be nothing but language, and yet by actually saying it, by embodying myself in that way, I make it real. Now I'll give you another example of where this happens, where language has the power to transform you. And it's, I've, I've mentioned it, I think, even in the last podcast again, it's the Buddhist practice of when you're being mindful, when you're starting a meditation, whether you, when you're doing a visualization, you gather round you people that you know and that you like. And you gather round you people that you know and with, who you dislike. And you gather round you people that you don't know. Strangers, friends and enemies. You visualize them around you. And that means particular people, particular enemies. Somebody who has insulted you, who, who has offended you, who has robbed you, somebody that really has abused you. Maybe somebody in your childhood has abused you. Maybe the, the parent that turned away from you. All that stuff. And you bring them into the space of your mindfulness you gather them up, you visualize them with light going from your heart out to theirs, white light just powerfully going out to them, filling them with that they may, with love in the sense that they may be that they may find complete happiness in life. Just think of somebody that's your enemy and just focus on them this moment and say, "I wish that person have complete happiness. I wish that person be free from all suffering." That's the two sides of a Buddhist wish. To be free from suffering and to experience complete happiness. And you do that to somebody, and I'm telling you, it dissolves the negative lock that you have with that person. The negativity, the, the distaste you have, the anger you have, it, it, it melts it. It's like rays of the sun on a lump of ice in your heart. It melts it. Might not melt, melt it all at once. I... Remember years ago I was meditating and I used to practice every morning way back when I was in my 40s and there was a particular person that I was so really negative about, so offended by that I used to think about him and I'd say it went on for, for years I used to think about him. In fact I used, to, I used to bring him into my meditation even when I had completely softened my hostility against him. But all I'm saying is that sometimes it takes a long time. But it melts the intensity of your hatred a little bit every time you send a blessing out. It's one of the reasons why I often write the word blessings on emails. Because, because I, I want to keep alive the idea that we can bless each other. When we bless, as far as I can understand it, like when I wish somebody a blessing, when I say blessings, I mean it like the Buddhist wish. It's the same thing. May, may you be completely happy. May you find 100% happiness, complete, enlightened happiness, and may you be free from all suffering in this life and in all future lives. That kind of energy, when I give it out, does far more for me than maybe the other person. But that shows, again, the transformative power of language. That by embodying the words, by saying these things, they actually transform me. And that's why it makes complete sense when you think about Buddhist visualizations. So in Tibetan Buddhism, they do a lot of, you know, mentor deities, there's, there's guru yoga practice, there's all sorts of, there's white Tara practice. These are all practices where you visualize a particular Buddha. And then when you visualize 
the Buddhas before you in your presence and you re visualize you've gathered up your enemies and your friends and the strangers all around you. You have this like dynamic, it's like a big dialogue between the collectivity of good Buddhas before you and the collectivity of, of, of human beings around you. And then you, you, you enter into the dynamic of, let's say, prayers, you know, looking for forgiveness, offering, making offerings, all that sort of beautiful poetry that, that brings us beyond what is the rational world, beyond what is on the surface. But, but they're transformative, even if they're just language, they're still transformative. And I suppose where I really where I really tip into prayer is where you talk about everything ending because you generate it and then you stop generating it so it ends. You do you do let's say a meditation and you're visualizing a Buddha. But you could also be visualizing uh, a Christian saint. And so you do a visualization, you have a sense of the presence of somebody and you kind of do your asking forgiveness or, you know, thanking the mentor deity for being present or whatever. You kind of have this relationship with the mentor deity and you know that it's only language, you know it's in your heart that this is happening, it's, it's kind of in the depth of reality, it's not on the surface, There's, there isn't somebody actually there. And then what happens? Let's say that's all human. Let's say that's just using human language and you're, you're using transformative human language that's transforming you into a more gentle person. But, but where I go beyond that, where I go a, a threshold moment, is where in the stillness after that visualization, in the stillness after your mindfulness practice, in the stillness, in the aftertaste of all that, you're still there, you're still present, be here now, you're still there. And in that moment, you don't feel alone. You're no longer longing, but your longing has opened up like a wound. And now it's not a wound, it's a flower. And there is no words now. There's no words to explain what happens next. But it's the sensation that you're now receiving. You're no longer practicing mindfulness, which is something has a verb called practicing. You're no longer practicing anything. It's almost as if you're not breathing. It's almost as if you're not seeing. It's almost as if you're not hearing. You're receiving. There's some sensations coming through your body, on your skin, through your ears, your nose, your eyes. It's like an otherness. It's like, it's like somebody different. You experience it like receiving. And it's like it's like receiving love because the sensation, if you were to name it, would be it's wishing you to be completely happy. Wishing you to be free from all suffering. You're getting the sense that even in that moment you are, even in that moment, even if at the surface level you have a sore hip or a sore leg or a sore knee, but that at a depth, you're already receiving a kind of a sense of complete happiness, free from suffering. It is like the Buddha inside you, the Buddha to come, the Buddha that you are becoming endlessly over endless lifetimes, is already present in you. 
It is an awakening. It's awakening in Christian terms to, to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit that is God, the depth in all being, concentrating a moment of time at the surface of your being, of your identity. A union, like a marriage, a union between you, the surface, and the depth of your own being, the Godhead. This is such a privilege that we're here, you know, that we're here to experience that is such a privilege. I mean, it's, it's what, again, in the train in the preliminaries to say in, in Tibetan Buddhism, this is like precious human life, precious human life that that will be gone in an instant, will be gone so quickly, and yet now we are here. There's an urgency to be here now. There's an urgency to awaken now, because... Imagine if you take the poetry of the Buddhist tradition, it's like saying that from endless, beginningless life, you're coming again and again, reincarnating, emanating, cleansing karma, creating maybe bad karma, then cleansing. it. You're just doing this. How do you end up becoming human? How do you end up becoming human with, with kind of no wars going on around you? With, with no wild animals trying to eat you, so that you have time and leisure to meditate and be mindful and reflect. How are you so lucky? This, they say, this is as lucky, precious human life is as lucky as if the ocean had in it one, one tire floating on it, and if a turtle somewhere in that ocean came to the surface and happened to come up through that, ring that tire what are the odds of that a per one particular turtle in the whole universe of ocean let's say pacific ocean and you throw in one colored tire into the middle of it and you say i hope that particular turtle gets up through that that is how lucky every precious human life is that you and me are here Alive now. We don't know when it ends and it could end quite quickly, quite suddenly. And all we know is that our actions have consequences and that karma, those consequences follow us like a shadow. And then so, now is the time. It's what Jesus was saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, it's now. Be ye awake now. So, what I'm saying, and what I think was in that reading that I did from on Tuesday as I'm a Buddhist, it was that fundamental choice came to me about six years ago, whereby therapy and mindfulness brought me so far. But they still... <coughs> They still only brought me to a sense of awakening, which was my my sense of my own being here and now. And that there was a threshold over which I went. Always went. We all do it. It's, it we, we have this in us from children, the sense that the universe is actually speaking to us. It's not actually just us trying to control and dominate the world around us. We always have a sense that there is something reaching out to us. We, we feel it from other people. We feel it in the love of parents and the love of lovers and the love of siblings. We feel it in the bird song. We feel it in the trees. The sense that we're aware of an otherness, a you-ness, a thou-ness that that comes towards us. And when mindfulness gets you to a, a point of stillness and calm abiding, and then you just live there in that space and begin to receive a sense of presence that's around you. 
that's prayer. I, I thought I would do this particular meditation and a reading from that book today. It is the 12th of March, and what makes it monumental is that the Russian troops are surrounding Kiev. I don't know what's going to happen. But I felt an urgency to pray. I'm sitting here for the afternoon and I couldn't do anything else. I can't do anything else but wonder in shock and amazement at the idea of war again has returned to Europe. And then I think, well, <laughs> why are we so excited about it? War has been in Syria, it's been in the Middle East, it's been in Afghanistan. War is this raging noise that's there all the time, rolling around the universe. And I, I, I make no sense of it. But it, it does, you know, stimulate me to focus more and more on the poetry of faith, on the transformation that's possible by the embodiment of poetry and by the bliss that's available and the peace that's available. When I enter into the longing and just sit with it, and when I just sit with everything in a mindful sense of peace and then step over that threshold, which is like opening the heart and receiving the energy, call it what you want, call it energy, call it grace, call it life, call it Buddha, bodhicitta, that, that just gush of energy and love that the universe has for you, for you. That the universe, like a mother, holds you in her womb, loves you, calls you to awaken. I just felt the urge to do that this afternoon, to do that with my language, with my voice to share with you, to be present with you as the war rumbles on. And I thank you for being here. And the irony is, you know, that, that choir in Minsk that I mentioned at the very beginning of this are still there. They're still there in Belarus, and they're still singing away. And And I just listen to it, I suppose, because I find I find other people's prayer and the sound of other people's prayer. I find it comforting. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Mm.